I recall a talk I once heard from Matt Dillahunty of Atheist Experience fame where he lamented the failure of the skeptical movement to fully embrace atheism and, at the same time, lamented the failure of the atheist movement to fully embrace skepticism. Well, our guest tonight might just be the skeptical atheist synthesis that Dillahunty had in mind. You might know <laughs> Professor Stephen from his snake oil woo-woo busting on Atheists on Air. And you may also remember him from possibly the greatest Farnsworth quote of all time. Professor, welcome yes. to the show. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I am so glad to finally have you. Now, I should also mention that many of our listeners might also know Professor Stephen from his guest appearance on Cognitive Dissonance just a couple of days ago. Um, and knowing that we share a lot of listeners, normally we try to avoid having a guest on that those guys just interviewed. But luckily for us, Professor Stephen has promised to be far more interesting and engaging tonight than he was on their show, so it'll be a whole different experience. <laughs> Really appreciate appreciate that, sir. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> now, for the record, are are, are you a, a real professor, or do you just play one on a podcast? I just play one on a podcast. It was a it was sort of a joke, you know, like uh, the professor character on uh, Sid Caesar's, you know, show of shows, that kind of thing. Okay. I was going to sort of play a character like that, and then I didn't. I just was myself, and so I kept the name. Uh, although technically, I was a, prof a prof an adjunct professor. Uh, I taught chemistry labs at a local college for a while, and they called me professor. So it's not completely misappropriation of credentials. And I also have to say, whether you're being yourself or not, you are a character, sir. So it's you're pretty pretty accurate on this one. So now, so are you a chemist? That's what you do now. Yes, I am a chemist. Yes, I have a master's degree in chemistry. Awesome, awesome. There are some compounds that might not be legal that we can talk about later that I, I wouldn't mind you uh, popping up for me. But, you know, we'll, like I said, yeah. we'll, we'll discuss that off the air. Um, so now, <laughs> but this is what I find very interesting. I didn't realize this until I heard you on Cognitive Dissonance, but you were a, uh, you were a fundamentalist Christian until very recently, correct? That is correct, yeah, until about three years ago. Okay, so now th that, that overlaps with the chemist thing? You were a fundamentalist Christian <laughs> chemist? Interesting. Yes, I was. <laughs> okay, so that seems worth exploring to me. Did, did you ever see a contradiction between what you were learning in school and what you'd learned in church? Uh, I I tried to avoid taking things that would contradict what I learned in church. Well, I would think so, all like, of the like scientists the would do that to some yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Skip the chemistry part, yeah. Yeah, uh, you know, I thought chemistry was a safe one because, you know, what did it have to do with the Bible? But then whenever you study chemistry, you study kinetics. Mm -hmm. And then you study, then you you can study uh, mass spectrometry, and then you can study dating the Earth, for instance, isotopic abundances and kinetic times, and so even then there were things that you know, I just like, well, I won't, I don't want to study that part because I, 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 the scientists must have it wrong because it disagrees with the Bible, so I won't study it. No kidding. So you were able yeah. to go all the way through your your schooling without like ever cracking that egg. Yes, correct. I just compartmentalized things. Mm -hmm. All right, and and you weren't you I mean you were like hardcore like just like hardcore for a Southern Baptist correct? Oh yeah, yeah I was a independent premillennial pre tribulation King James only no literature Bible believing Baptist. <laughs> so you 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 like majored in cognitive dissonance? That was great that they had. You yeah, yes, I did. I, I did. I majored <laughs> in cognitive dissonance exactly. Right on, right on. Well, that actually leads really well into what you do uh, now on Atheist on Air. Now, I, I do want to ask you this because I, we learned earlier in the show uh, that Dr. Ben Carson, GOP hopeful, aced his chemistry finals because God gave him the answers in a dream. I'm curious yeah. if you have the same experience or if no. God <laughs> liked Ben Carson more than you. <laughs> the motherfucker never helped me out with a goddamn thing. <laughs> Boy, did I pray. <laughs> right. Okay, so now if all of this, you know, actual book learning and whatnot wasn't enough to crack your, your fundamentalist show, what was? That's a good question. Well, the book learning did help. Mm -hmm. It did help because when I was working on my master's degree, I really got into sort of the philosophy of science, how we do it, uh, using inductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, that kind of thing, plus experimental experimentation and that sort of thing. And I realized that I hadn't really applied that. I'd applied that to most things. Like I was already an anti-snake oil person at that point. Uh -huh. I already advocated against a lot of myths and um, uh, bad science out there, but I had never applied it to my personal belief system, my faith. Right. Uh, I just sort of made that separate. It had to be true. Um, you know, for various non-rational reasons, like, well, if it, if it, if it isn't true, then 
I don't know anything really about how the universe works. I don't know what happens after you die. Uh, there's a good chance nothing does. And my parents and I and everyone I love have been wrong all our lives. I dedicated my life to a, a series of myths, that, all those reasons. Mm-hmm. But I've, I was finally, I guess you could say, brave enough to sit down one day on the toilet as – I talked about on cognitive dissonance and Where start all thinking. All the best moments, thoughts best come moments. from, yeah. And yeah, good, good exactly. Crosswords too. <laughs> exactly. I sat down on the toilet and thought about, I applied the logic that I'd learned to what I believed about God and realized, wait a minute, um, <laughs> this doesn't make any sense. I shouldn't believe in something until I have evidence for it. Uh-huh. And the evidence I thought I had wasn't really evidence. It was just emotions, right. you know, and you can, you can induce emotions in a person with electrodes or drugs. It doesn't have to – it doesn't prove anything. Well, I think we should try with the drugs anyway. I, I don't care if it proves anything anyway. Um, but no, <laughs> I, I do think you used the right word there, courage, because like for a guy like me, I, so I – for whatever, you know, whatever you would call deconversion for me, I'm like nine years old and I'm like, okay, this doesn't make sense. Grandma's full of shit. Um and that's very easy, but for a guy like you that gets into his 30s and for whom this is such a big part of your identity, to have the courage to apply this skepticism to something so personal to you, like that, that's I, – I think that's what stands between so many very intelligent, very rational religious people, and the truth is just that they lack that courage. Well, I agree, or – uh, one other thing was is that I'd become disillusioned with my church. I had seen – well, I had actually studied the Bible. I'd read it, mm-hmm. and uh, – that I had seen that a lot of it's a great book. No. I'm, yeah, we're, we're loving it. We're we're doing the same thing actually. Yeah, it's been fan oh, yeah. fucking tastic. <laughs> oh yeah, oh absolutely. If you want to be an atheist, just read the Bible. Right. right, I said that before. But I had noticed that the pastors that I was sitting under that were preaching to me and telling me the the truth were lying to me. Like a lot of the stuff that they were saying were in the was in the Bible wasn't even in there. Oh wow! So they were lying and square. So. <laughs> Yeah, I decided to sort of get out of the church for a while and try to find my own way. Mm-hmm. And you know what? Not going to a brainwashing session one to three times a week really helps. No kidding. <laughs> no get that brain know, dirty though. It, it's funny yeah. to me because I, I I think about that all the time. I I I wonder why that it in itself isn't a tell for a lot of Christians. Like, why would they want you to keep going back? Like, you don't have to keep going back to chemistry one hundred and one every few weeks to remind yourself of all of these principles. You know, once you got them, you got them. You don't you know read from basic chemistry texts every night, reading over and over the same passages and whatnot. Knowledge is completely like different. It's acquired in a different way than religious belief. Right, exactly. You know, it's it's a form of indoctrination. They even say it from the pulpit. Mm-hmm. Indoctrination. We have to beat this into your head, and you have to be reminded of it over and over again because, truly, it isn't an, it isn't obvious that it's true. In fact, it isn't true. You know, mm-hmm. and so we have to convince you that it is by beating you over the head with it three, or one to three times a week. Right. Exactly. So now I'm afraid we've gotten uh, so in the weeds on all of this weird being a Christian and a chemist at the same time concept (laughs) um, that I'm afraid we're going to end up skipping over my favorite thing that you do. A lot of people will uh, know you from Atheist on Air for all of the snake oil woo-woo segment uh, uh, stuff that you've – it's a wonderful little uh, exploration into cognitive dissonance and insanity. Um, Now, before we actually get into that, I want to kind of define our terms. What is snake oil woo-woo? Well, I would define that – those are two separate terms, of course, okay. snake oil being the term for just uh, fake medicine coming from the era of the snake oil salesman where there was even someone who literally sold snake oil. Uh, well, I say literally, not really literally, literally claimed to sell snake oil. It wasn't actually snake oil. <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> he was lying squared too. Awesome. Yeah. And, of course, woo-woo meaning the bullshit uh, – sort of spooky explanations people give for various things they claim are true. Mm -hmm. So snake oil woo-woo would be the bullshit pseudoscience explanations for fake medicine. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Now, I know that you talked at length about one of your least favorite pseudosciences with Tom and Cecil. So rather than going back over that discussion of homeopathy, I want to present our listeners with a homeopathic dilution of the explanation that you gave on their (laughs) show. Like a ch***. (laughs) <laughs> so could you give us like a, a non-homeopathic example of something else that you might highlight on uh, the snake oil woo-woo segment? Oh, absolutely. Uh, one of my favorites that I've done before is uh, colloidal silver. 
Okay. Uh, that doesn't sound real. <laughs> it's a it's a thing. Uh, it's it's silver uh, particles dispersed in a liquid through a colloidal suspension, and because silver is known as an antibacterial agent, somehow drinking this shit or rubbing it on your skin will cure you of all things. What drinking silver? Drinking get silver. Rid of that vampirism. Yes. Yeah, no, that's useful stuff. Like, <laughs> yeah, Drink it, some it's metal. good if you're a werewolf, <laughs> right? Yeah. So okay, so now look, t- tell me, um, because that strikes me as a bad thing. Is that uh, dangerous? Yeah. Is ever love in hell, or is silver inert? Not, not specifically dangerous. It's fairly inert. I mean, it can cause uh, a, a large quantities of it can cause problems with your kidneys and liver and things, but in general, it's pretty innocuous. Uh, especially at the levels that most of these people are selling it at, which are near homeopathic anyway. Gotcha. But the reason it's one of my favorites is because some people really get into it and either manufacture their own, which is much more concentrated, or years ago they had much more concentrated solutions before the FDA stepped in and sort of cracked down on it. And if you take lots and lots of silver into your body, it look, it goes to your skin. It preferentially comes out into your skin. And then – it develops like a black and white photograph. Really? And you turn blue. <laughs> this this is a real thing? You can smurf yourself by ingesting silver? Yes, correct. There's a fellow named Paul, Paul uh, Carrison. Who blew who himself? This. He blew himself. He looks, like, he looks like Papa Smurf. If you look him up, he looks like Papa Smurf. All right, I feel bad laughing at the guy, but uh, I'm sure once I see the picture, I won't. Um, oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> That's why it's one of my favorites, because it's just so ridiculous. Uh, he did that to himself. There was a woman named Rosemary Jacobs who got it, uh, who was per, uh, prescribed Claudio Silver by some quack in a nasal drop and turned gray. Oh, wow. Uh, and that pretty much ruined her life, because people thought she was sick and wouldn't have anything to do with her. But uh, So there's a sad side to it as well. I think the guy turning himself into Papa Smurf is hilarious, but the, <laughs> but the poor woman having turning gray and ruining her life. <laughs> yeah, no. Objectively, that's hilarious. I think we can. I think yeah. we can say that one as a scientific certainty. So, would you say that that's? I mean, I mean, I guess at a certain point, this is like asking you to pick the ugliest toenail fungus. But would you say that that's the wackiest form of woo that you've come that you've come across so far? Not, not, not really. No, because that's it. That's just based on a misunderstanding of how silver on the outside of your body can be antibacterial, while it's inside your body, it's not really going to do anything. At least it's something that isn't completely out there. I think mm-hmm. the thing that's most, that I think is the most wooey is uh, uh, magic words on water. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> the angry and happy words. Yes. There's an entire company called Aqua Mantra. Oh, God. <laughs> of course there is. Oh, fucking course there is. Yes. <laughs> Premium natural spring water is simply water that resonates with the energy and frequency of your well-being. What? The quality, <laughs> premium. It's, the quality of your thoughts determine the quality of your life, and now your water. We deliver powerful messages to you through the mantras: "I am grateful," "I am healthy," "I am loved," or "I am lucky." So they talk to the water and then sell it to you. Yeah, this is the kind of thing that Gwyneth Paltrow raises an eyebrow at. I do believe. Yeah, exactly. It's all. I wouldn't put that in my vaginal steamer. That sounds ridiculous. <laughs> Wouldn't even work, I would imagine. This water's bullshit. Exactly. I want to know who the I am grateful water is for. Does anyone just buy that? Or do you buy that for your, like, ungrateful little prick of a nephew who sneaks into his, into his coffee or something? I, I just, like, you know, like, at the very least, if it's going to be bullshit, let's go, the, oh, I am erect. How about sell I am erect water? Like, that's way better than grateful if it's not going to work anyway. Okay, so let me ask you this, man. Are, are we doomed? I mean, like, if somebody out there is buying the mantra water, um, is there any hope for the human race, you think? Oh, it does make one kind of depressed, doesn't it? Uh, I think so. I think, well, what I'm doing here, and I think what you're doing on your show with your, uh, is this, is it called the Is This Bullshit segment? Uh, how, bullshit how bullshit is it? Is it? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It, let me, it, let me give it, it, let me it. give it with the echo. You want thing. to do the echo yourself? There you go. How, how bullshit, bullshit is it? Is it? Right. That's it. <laughs> That's awesome. Now, maybe now we can it. educate some people. Unfortunately, we're only educating atheists, but, uh, you know, and maybe a few Christians who listen to our program. <laughs> yeah, probably but, not ours. 
maybe yeah. yours, maybe yours. Well, you guys are, you know, you take some calls and stuff like that, and like you're, I wouldn't say you're friendly to them, but you're not like It's us. good that we don't take calls. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's probably a good thing. <laughs> oh, my God, I couldn't even imagine the shit people would say on your show if they could call in. I wouldn't be worried about what they would say. No, <laughs> uh, I, I wasn't either. I wasn't either. <laughs> Just be deaf. I have a clean mouth, but this guy's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, I say, and, yeah. I say, fuck I, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> I refer to Irimatio here and there. Um, so, like, but in your Face opinion, fucking, though, I mean, that's what that means? Because I know it's not just idiots who are buying this stuff. Maybe the mantra water, but like, like, like you, you see very intelligent people who buy. You know, you see Fortune 500 companies, you know, paying feng shui consultants and blood typing perspective in place. So, why do intelligent people buy into this shit? That's a good question. I think it's because of a lack of uh, education mm -hmm. on certain topics. There are a lot of intelligent people who don't know the first thing about science. Right. Uh, uh, because it's not prioritized. And they're not taught critical thinking. Uh, they're taught superstitions. Uh, a lot of intelligent people are religious. And uh, whenever you're taught religious myths are true, it's not a hard leap to start believing all kinds of crazy things. Yeah. And in fact, in my, in my experience as a fundamentalist, not only do we believe a bunch of crazy stories in the Bible, we also believed a lot of, um, a lot of uh, conspiracy theories and a lot of wooey stuff too. You know, this idea that God made natural things so natural things can cure us, that kind of mm -hmm. naturalistic fallacy that comes from, from religion. Um, so there, I think the only cure is, is education. And I think that you know, we can do our part with our podcasts and trying to get it out there. And then there's blogs and people who debunk things like James Randi. Mm -hmm. uh, but people have just got to learn to think, learn to question uh, what they're being told. I think a lot of these things get spread by word of mouth. And they believe that, say, colloidal silver would cure them of their cancer because Uncle Fred told them. Right. People have got to understand that you've got to question what Uncle Fred says, too. He's not, he's not the Pope. He isn't infallible. And the, neither is the Pope. Yeah, yeah. Hey, correct. Yeah. So, well, you, you come back to education several times. So let me dig into that just a little bit because, you, like you said, we educate ourselves. And, and very much we're, we're kind of talking into an echo chamber with a lot of this stuff. Like I, I would imagine most of our listeners already know, you know, colloidal silver is something that you should avoid. Um, so yeah. how do we bring this message to the rest of the world? Because what I see, like, I, okay, like I got a buddy who's a rational guy. I see some, like, Zycam on his counter or whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. And if I try to engage him about that, what I usually find is, okay, they've already bought into the, the, the bullshit here. They're already invested in the Zycam or the Airborne or whatever. And, and so when I bring it to him, like, I get a lot of anger and resistance. Is there, in your yeah. experience, a best way to approach this subject with people? That's a good question because for a lot of people, it's very much like uh, talking about religious concepts or the supernatural. They've already sort of invested themselves into it, and so they're – in order to <clears> – <throat> as Mark Twain said, it's easier to fool someone than it is to convince them that they've been fooled. And so it's, yeah. di <laughs> it's difficult because it, it hurts their ego. And I know it hurt my ego whenever I realized that I was full of shit <laughs> when it right. came to God. <laughs> But I, I was a scientist, so I was used to feeling like I'm full of shit. So, because uh, in science, you're usually wrong, when, and you do experiments and say, "Damn it, I'm wrong again." But a lot of people don't like that feeling. I think maybe the best thing to do is to sort of be gentle about it, mm -hmm. uh, because what happens if, if you're too if you're too strong in your uh, attack on the snake oil woo woo or what have you, uh, it turns it makes them sort of double down and uh, want to defend it even more and really start believing it even more. So I'm thinking the only thing the only thing I can think of is just present them with the evidence and leave it at that. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm with you. It's just so frustrating sometimes when you see somebody that yeah. you care about, somebody that you love, getting ripped off, and there's just nothing that you can do about it. Exactly, it is frustrating. And I think, well, I think another thing though is uh, I think we that we have a problem in this country with uh, a lack of regulation. Right. When it comes to uh, when it comes to these sorts of things, I mean, homeopathy, for instance, got written into the law back in the 1930s mm -hmm. uh, that it's medicine that doesn't have to be proven to work or be effective. Well, that should be changed. That's a weird law. Yeah. Yeah, it is a weird law. It, but they pretty much said anything in the uh, homeopathic pharmacopoeia is OK to be sold as medicine. Yeah, no, I, I, we covered a story recently. I can't even remember now if it was on the scathing atheist or the skeptocrat where uh, about a, a Canadian 
bureau that basically approved a medicine because somebody sent them a copy of a, a, a 120 year old manuscript of homeopathy that said this thing did this thing and that was considered right. enough evidence to actually pass muster and get approved as a medicine in Canada and, and Canadians are smarter than us I mean we're dumber than <laughs> that yeah that's true and there's a lot of skepticism of science so they, they don't want to you know we have this on the right we have skepticism of science because of their Bible disagreeing with reality mm -hmm. and scientists arguing for reality. So they're skeptical. So they say we come from monkeys and they say the earth's millions of years old. So I can't trust them when they say that I shouldn't be taking collodial silver for my boner problems, you know. Um, and then on the left, we have this, oh, well, all the mainstream medicine, that's all – from big corporations that have a vested interest in, in keeping us sick. And so what you got to find is some, is some you know, um, non-mainstream cure that actually works. It's almost like hipster medicine. Right. Like, I don't take medicine that actually works. I take medicine that no one's ever heard of. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I had this buddy, uh, it was actually my roommate for quite a while, and, it, and anything that you presented him, if it's like, you know, well, re, uh, you know, well sourced and it's come from a scientific journal, he'll just brush that aside in a heartbeat. But if it's some dirty hippie at the parking lot of a Grateful Dead show trying to sell him some bag of green fungus that'll make him live forever, he will swallow that whole. It's insane. It's insane. And I honestly don't know how to solve this problem. It seems yes. it seems like literally mental illness to me. Right. I think that <laughs> you actually may have hit on it, though, because I think that the only real way to, to solve this problem is preemptively, and that's by teaching people critical thinking. And that's where yeah. I think you know the atheist uh, skeptical movement really needs to convene, because the reason that we don't get critical thinking in schools, I think, is because of what it would do to religious belief. Right, exactly. So the one – the one set of bullshit is 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 in synergy with the other set of bullshit. Yeah. You know? <laughs> right. And and these people who are religious are willing to take the bullshit, you know, homeopathy and and mantra water, uh, <laughs> if that's what it takes to to get to keep their religion as well. A lot of the times. Right. Exactly. Uh, we'll let you have we'll let you have the you can massage their aura as long as they don't question. Right. There were all the animals on an ark. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'll buy your shit if you buy my <laughs> shit. Exactly. Right. Exactly. We got to protect the bullshit. It's important. It's important. All right. Yeah. So let's say I get into an argument about this. I want to be ready. Maybe you could walk us through some good counter arguments. To, for example, I can imagine somebody arguing in favor of the placebo effect. You know, mm -hmm. in in order to work, someone has to make you think it's real. So maybe doctors need to be giving you sometimes fake stuff. Or point point being, you can't just give yourself a sugar pill and get the placebo effect, but the placebo effect is a real thing that can help you. So, you know, maybe if you buy something called the holistic pathic herbal health supplement, it can help <laughs> you believe that something's happening and you could actually get – so question is, you know, how do we get the placebo effect ethically? Do you have an – you know, how, how would I deal with that argument and how would oh, I answer right. that question? That's a good one because you can actually get a little bit of the placebo effect if you give yourself a sugar pill knowing full well that it is a sugar pill. Oh, okay. It, you can get part yeah. of it even knowing that it's completely useless. Complete, exactly. Okay. Uh, but the, 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 the theatrics of, say, acupuncture make it an even more uh, potent placebo. Mm -hmm. Right. So there's something to that argument or but I, I, right. I pre, you know i'd like to know what what's not not good about it <laughs> there's 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 two things one uh, doctors used to prescribe placebos all the time and then they decided it was unethical and uh, so they, they they're not really doing that anymore officially but the other thing is is that you get the placebo effect anyway even if you take medicine that works so if you have medicine that actually will treat what's wrong with you you get the actual chemical uh, medicinal properties of that medicine Plus the placebo effect. Oh, okay. Well, that's a great answer. Okay. <laughs> right. So there's there's no reason to use placebos if we have good medicine there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, I got to say, you know, I, I could probably talk to you all night and keep getting interesting information out of you. Unfortunately, the show has a limit. So if you want to hear more of this fine Southern gentleman, you can find him on Atheist on Air podcast with our good friend Cash. You can find them at AOA.FM or by following the links you'll find on the show notes for this week's episode. Professor Stephen, thanks again for your time, sir. Oh, thank you. It was great.